everybody for being here. And um, well, we're going to get started. We, uh, we're, we're, we have limited time, but we have a lot to come. So take it away. Thanks, Andre. Before we start, I'm going to need each and every one of you to connect to somebody else. Everybody on TV talking about how we're going to do better, but they don't even understand the history, and YouTube is not going to save it. So what I need for you to do is understand this word, and it's called my offer. Can you say my offer? My offer. Let me hear it again. My offer. Everyone talks about the Holocaust, but we really just understand sometimes what Wikipedia is talking about. We really want to go back to those who actually have the truth and is our ancestors. So the shackles that I wear, I was blessed that they were actually taken off of the slave ship. I only bring them out when we do the Ma'afa. And the Ma'afa is the remembering of that we are all connected. There is no monopoly on anything or hardship. We all have it. But our ancestors found a way to move on. So I'm going to ask you to do the scariest thing on the planet right now. And that is in front of this complete big old stranger, I need you to close your eyes. Sometimes I would have to walk miles and miles and miles to get to a ship. Sometimes they would be into a slave castle, and if you were overweight, they would keep you in that castle till you fit down to get through the next door. Sometimes you would sit on that shore, and you knew that you had gone through the last mile. Then they would sit and connect you with those that didn't speak like you. Even back then, they knew if you didn't speak the same language, then that's how we separate you. I don't even have to worry about your class because there's no communication with none of you. And as I put you head to foot and foot to head, woman is not excluded because they had a whole side of the ship for her. Whether you were pregnant and gave birth, they would take your children and toss them over the side. Men would also play games with pregnant women. They would take these knives, cut open her stomach and take out the child and they would stomp her so there was nothing left. And they would kick it all over the side. History shows you that the sharks that moved in these oceans started changing their migration because there was so much food that was coming off these ships that they started following the ships. Men who decided they would be strong enough that you can't take me. I won't eat. I'd rather die with my belly starving. And men had to wait to take care of that. They would just take hammers and they would break out your front teeth. They would make shift funnels and force food you to eat. You would be swollen, kind of sickened with holes in your body and they would give you salt water for showers. They would tell you, dance me, gross dance, because this is where you got your power. That story sounds a little familiar. We don't talk about the Africans that got on these ships and actually moved away. So mad I'm here in San Antonio and understood that the Hispanics and the Latinos and whatever you want to call yourself was better respected back in the day because all they did was when these Africans took over ships, they got drums, they built drums and they just played. And for some reason, when they got to the areas of Mexico, those drums were answered. So it'd be your Duduwa or your Jimbe next to the conga drum, and we started to make families. Don't you understand that our food still tastes the same? We still had some of the same spices. Our women, the same. But if I keep putting a little hate and a little disrespect, and I keep saying that your language is the best, we won't even talk about that. We have a continent with over 1,500 languages in its breast. We won't just keep you abreast with this situation. Then I'm going to keep you on ships for months and months. And God, I don't know who to talk to because everybody keeps talking about police brutality to the end. They keep talking to one another, but man, they don't know how to the answers. So maybe I need to go back to the one who knew me first. Maybe I need to get back to the spiritual circle and understand that this is going to fill my thirst. I'm having you all here right now because I don't know what else to do. 
Cops don't keep on doing what they do until we start unlearning the education that was learned to them in the beginning. But I need you all to stop trying to be the only one winning. We speak with one voice and one sound. We have to be unified now. I'm tired of having sisters over here being disrespected. I'm tired of the videos in MTV talking about how they need to be rejected. Every song out here talking about other people's clothes. So much disrespect. I just want to go back to that old music. I didn't even need words for it. It just had that vibe. I think that's why I like jazz the best. That means it is a family. You want to know the answer? It's family. You want to understand how we get to the next level, it's family. And family just don't mean mom and dad, it means uncle, nephew, niece, understand. I still love San Antonio because I like seeing eight people get out of one car. <laughs> they say it's hot, but we got love. Love don't beat it all. And now what I'm going to ask you is I'm going to give you something for those who came on these ships whether it had been Chinese to Africa, being in the bottom and the belly of the beast, they all craved one thing, and that was light. And I give it back to you. Open your eyes. on my side of the, uh, of the city and their boyfriends are beating them down and grown big old men sitting there just watching out of order none of my women should ever have to fear anything at all but we're not with us so we, we talk about white privilege and we talk about all that other stuff if we don't get this family together you know, one of my favorite TV shows was Good Times because the father didn't play. Whatever I got to do for mine, I'm going to do for mine. And I need you to know that if I'm walking down the street, I got you. I don't even have to know you, but I got you. Because the respect level, clean you. And if it wasn't for you, there would be no me. And we don't, we don't talk about that no more. When I got here, nobody even wanted to understand that, that we come from something so incredible. You know? And, 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 and you, bro. And, I, and I'm only, because we family. With the compass, the square, and the working tools that we moved around here on boats and ships, and our children don't know any of that. So yeah, I'm going to shoot you. Why am I shoot you? I don't like me. So what I'll do is I'll kill anything that looked like me so I ain't got to physically hurt me, but I can get my pain out. Because I don't, nobody loved me. And how many black people are in the videos? That they're showing right. the 70s and the white people are the ones that are killing the yeah. But I, 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 I feel like I grew up in that colorblind era, and that's become a weapon to ignore the yeah. crisis, the situation we're in now. The fact that we're even recognizing that there's a disparity of racism now, today, we're recognizing the racial issue, and that's not colorblind. And so it's, it's another weapon, like, just like almost, I mean, it's like the all lives matter. So, so, so I have a question, from 1 to 10, how well does this community understand police brutality from 1 to 10? Outside of this room? Give yourself a break. Outside of this room? Yeah, that's what I have Zero. Zero? We're at zero, okay. We gave ourselves an F. Okay, as a, a whole. Okay. I mean, I'll give it a one. But as a whole, okay, there we go. Okay. So it just tells you the work that we need to do. And why does this 
this new newly formed groups will matter in San Antonio and everywhere else because, because this is the work we have. It's cut out for us already. But I think white communities do understand. The question is that I think can we imagine what can, can we imagine what kind of community we would have to live in without the police? I mean we would have to deal with all sorts of issues in that process and I feel like we do understand and in many ways we justify it without actually looking at the root causes. And so I think to say that we don't understand, I think it's I don't think it's really true. That's I think the question is, is I think the question is we do understand, but what do we do with that understanding? We don't think we understand it and we justify it. But if that had been reversed, that black man would have been captured on every police station all across the all all over the world, whether he did it or not. But nobody knew about this white guy and the two officers and wounded and hurt. It's the media. The media is what changes everybody's perception about us. It's the media. Until they won the Super Bowl, then they took him from a D, right. and they put him right back on top. So the media really has to be in a controlled state to where they're going to put things on a level playing field. Because they can demonize you today, and they're looking and like a superstar tomorrow in less than 24 hours. So really, that's that, that's part of the situation. The media, the media, the media, social media, really all, all types of media, because we really don't control no media. The channel's not out, BET is not out, and they dictate and they, they dictate what goes on and what doesn't go on. So if you go on now with a secret agenda, unless it's live, it'll never get broadcast. I commend LeBron James, Carmelo Anthony, Wayne Wayne, Chris Paul for what they did. I commend them for that. And it's really, we need really public figures like that that have a voice to really start stepping out and saying certain things about the situation that's going on. If not, the lower class people, because like you said, you got rich, you got poor, ain't no middle class. Say people, but you're amongst white people. I think the good thing is to confront the situation. Admit, it's obviously okay for us to be like, uh, but that's obviously a racist comment we need to call out. But I think that's the first step at least in saying it's not okay to be racist. You can't have this conversation with if you make a joke, it's inappropriate. Yeah. Tell them it's not right. I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I want to ask you a, a very specific question, just kind of for my own understanding here. In 2015, how many unarmed black, well, uh, yeah, un un unarmed black people died as a result of police violence? What do you think that number is? That I don't know. I just got to say, I'm not an FBI. At least 102. Okay, we you know we, we we pull a few names all kind of off the top of our head, Mike Brown. You know, it, it's way more than that, and, and and most people have no idea. If we talk, people say, well, all these police officers dying. That's no, not true. Not. The number of pe police officers dying on the line of duty is 60% what it was 20 years ago, it, and it's dropping every year. So when five policemen die in Dallas, that is a tragedy, but it's not the whole story. And, and if we let that become the whole story, we're losing the battle. And I'd like to go back to Brooklyn. I just told you on the radio, like Joe Pags, was like, you know, racism is why because of Obama. You know, and that goes back to the point that, like, if you're not educated, if you don't know history, and really you only pay attention to now, you're like, yeah, racism aside, this is the easy office. So, like, my first thing is you can change that. And there's a current thread in the psychology that says that part of the reason you're really shooting is because cops, when they get scared, they go into fight or flight mode. Yeah, and the because when they see a white person, they're not afraid. But when they see a black person, their initial inner core says this is dangerous and so they shoot. So it's like a complete like re-education, like it's a very core issue that like needs a lot of work going back to educating people about the history of like man. I don't think there is vehicle for them to speak up. They also have friends. They come from backgrounds where 
you abuse the past, you were tortured, you were, you know, killed, and so this thing that happens still now. You know, obviously, we know it happened in Mexico with the students, it happens in Central America all the time. Yes, yes. Now, actually, all Latin America is becoming very right wing government, so it's putting even worse. Right. And people are being, like, really suppressed as far as, like, speaking up of this issue. Right. So I think we need to know who is our community. Right. If we're talking about all this, we're going to stop this. It has to be demands now. Like you said, we've been asking for years, and look at where we're still in the same place that we've been with our parents, our grandparents. We're still sitting there. So now it is down to demanding what we want from our allies and from the government and from whoever else. We have to demand. Go in that way. With power, we have that now. And we have to go in there with our chest out and our hands held high and say, this is what we want. We're tired of asking. You're not listening to us. We want it. And that's the way we need to. We need to approach things. I was going to say that. What word? If you stop spending your money with these people, the only thing, the only thing a lot of those people understand is the dollar. We're the biggest consumer in America. But yes, we're the, we're the poorest according to their income tax brackets and economical brackets and all of that. If we stop spending money in certain places, I can guarantee you things will change. You just can't go, oh, I feel like hospital. Nah, get it. It, it's colonization of the political process, of uh, anything that goes in the workplace, just that we sometimes dominate the meetings. We have to be more cognitive of our dominance. There, there, we are dominant in this country, and we are going to be losing the percentage. Like uh, Our numbers are going to drop, but we've got to become more human in that process, and, that, and the way to understand what other people are going through. It is the first step, I think, because we have a lot, a lot to work on, in my opinion. So, because we are so residential, we segregate. Right, right. But when, and I've been one of these people that when I see someone pulled over by the cops, and, the, and I immediately, I'm just like, Whoa, what are they going to do? Is they going to, you know? And I'm like, I'll go around the block and keep an eye on the situation. And, and I think that um, getting out and, and taping it, if you can, you know what I mean. We all have jobs, we all have lives, we have to get places. But if you can, be a witness to things that are happening. I mean, I think that the presence of a white person with a camera phone could be the difference between life and death. Did you have your
uh, with uh, with the, the, the police, reinforces colorism uh, as an institution, uh, increases racial tension between ethnic groups, and minimizes our voices, and increases the fear to speak out um, as Hispanics or Latinos or whatever the heck we are over here. <laughs> um, it, it makes it difficult for us to, to it increases a divisiveness. It makes us more, more divisive makes us uh, not want to speak out as we should and know we should. Um, it, it causes us to lose trust in the community, to lose trust in the police force, perpetuates cultural and racial stereotypes, um, and uh, towards the police. Uh, I noticed that while we were discussing how police brutality affects uh, our community that we didn't, few of us commented on, um, on the way it makes us feel towards the police. And, and when we brought that question up, uh, some of the things that arose were that it makes us afraid and, and timid uh, around the police. It amplifies the respectability politics. Um, it, it makes a, us afraid to take a stand uh, and makes us complacent, causes compulsion, um, and, and makes us feel as though we have to choose sides. Um, I think that I think that sums it up. Okay. So we came up with more than 10, so if you would just bear with me, I'm going to try to convince them. Um, one of the first things we came up with is that we need our allies to start voting for things that impact the black community. We also want you to fight for equality, so promote that. The conversation begins with you. So we really need your voice, we need you talking, we need you out there canvassing and so forth. We need to cease using labels. They're derogatory and they're not getting us anywhere. All it's doing is promoting hate. So that can start with you as well. We need you to not be fearful. Number one, we have your backs. If you're standing up for something for us, you best believe we're going to support you in return. Okay? We need to stop the police quotes. That's part of why our crime rate is going up. That's part of why we have these disparities. That's part of why we have these trying to be the quota, you're trying to be, you know, the big bad cop. What's happening? Losing lives. It's going haywire. It's not going the way you saw it playing out in your mind, right? It's going just the opposite. We discussed that we need to help black officers take a stand so where they're not uh, being ridiculed on the job, all right? Letting them know that they don't have to choose. Just because they're law enforcement, it doesn't mean they have to go out and arrest us at a higher rate. Okay? It doesn't mean they have to be leaving you to work here on Bucon. We need to embrace them, let them know that it's okay. We need to make sure that our allies understand that Black Lives Matter is not offensive. It's not a hate group. If you're going to be with us, you have to understand what it is that you're joining. That's very, very, very important. We need to make sure that we are giving police officers proper training on how to de-escalate situations. Some of the ways we can do that, we talked about better fitness for duty evaluation. Again, how are these officers on our street? How do we not know that they may have a tag and a racism in them? Who's doing those evaluations? Are we there? Are we asking the correct questions? Okay. We want to make sure that we actually have an operational definition of what policing is. So we need to redefine that. It could be that people think that policing is supposed to be about our talent. I'm not as a police officer unless I use some type of aggression or assertion. We also talked about um, our allies need to challenge their friends who may not understand the Black Lives Matter movement. We also need to make sure that you're kind of walking a day in our shoes. And I'll let, can I get some help on that? The walking, <laughs> the walking a day in our shoes for the time. Oh, yeah, come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, basically what I meant by that was a lot of these so-called racist cops don't really know anything about us except what they see on TV and in the media. So they're not actually growing up in our community. They don't know our culture. They don't know anything about us. So when they see us, they, they strike fear in them. They think thugs, gangster killers, and it takes us out. So, kind of following that up, it was taking a stand with the media. There's not that many black-owned networks, so you all have a voice. You have your own um, radio station, the media station. So please be that voice for us. Get the word out.
out. Don't be afraid to speak up when it comes to the media. Uh, we need to make sure that kind of on that accord of speaking up when it comes to social media is making sure that our lives are valued just as much, if not more, than animals. It shouldn't be that an animal gets more likes on Facebook, and then when a black person gets killed, there's no such thing. Right. Okay. So we definitely need your help with that. Uh, this is a this is a big one, so I'm going to spend a little time on this one. Is we really have to have a conversation about the damaging effects of white supremacy and how it is that you know you may benefit from white privilege and what that means. Because if we don't start having that discussion, we're not going to get anywhere. It really starts there. As we talked about uh, Black Lives Matter not being a hate group or a terrorist group of any type, we need to talk about the KKK. How come we have not fought to get that eradicated as a terrorist group? So we're asking on our, you know, for our allies to stand with us. Let's get that done. We have change.org. We have all these petitions you know, out here. How come we haven't started that one? If we have, if it hasn't gone anywhere, let's restart it. Let's get more signatures. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. I think you all just discussed this, but we want to harp on it. And it's great that you already had, you know, that insight. Is that basically we're more alike than we are different. So we really need to unify and just harp on that love, and that's going to really push our movement forward. Again, we talked more about the media perception. Um, saying that we don't control it. So maybe it's time that if you have a foot in the door, invite us in. Let us come with you. Let us come to those interviews. You know, we're not going to, again, put you out there by yourself. Please, we're sending an olive branch. Can I come with you? And I think that um, the very last one, I'm going to ask for a little help as well. Sharon, can you help me out? We were talking about um, the city hall meeting and that a lot of the times when we have these, they're held at a time when we're at work. So, since you're there, if we could have a list, if we could pass that list around, and we were saying just kind of make sure that our voices are heard that way, right? Maybe more of the community at the meeting. Okay. Because they don't live in our community, really, the ones that's representing us. They don't live in our neighborhood. They live somewhere where they're in a gated community, where they're protected. They don't live in the hood. You know, so we need somebody to represent each one of the different communities at the meetings and speak up and say what your councilman is not doing or your councilwoman is not doing for your community. Speak up against the different, you know, the problems you may have or find out what they're doing with the money that they're given to take care of our communities and they're not doing it. Because our kids are having to go all the way to the north side to go have a birthday party at a pizza place. Why don't we have a pizza place on each side. We can have big parties at the game rooms. Why don't we have anything to get for our kids to enjoy? They always have to go to the northwest side, the northeast side. You know, that's not fair. Our kids deserve the same that all the other kids are in the same way. That's, you know, so we need to speak up at the, uh, at the, at the meetings. That's pretty much it. This last one seems to be for us, but if you all don't mind, I just want to share it. We were talking about empowerment and teaching our children at home. I'm just going to ask that our allies do that as well. You know, it starts at home. If you start having conversations about why we need to align with one another, your children are going to pass that on. And guess what? There are going to be many advocates at school saying, oh, this is what we need to do. You know, spread love, spread love, spread love. Okay, so um, how does police brutality affect our community? Um, one of the first things that was thrown out was that it's, it's a word. Um, we're embarrassed, we're mad, it makes us nauseous, we cry, we're embarrassed to be white, we want to apologize, um, we feel like we benefit from the system, we're powerless somehow to impact change, that's part of the reason why we're here, um, we feel guilty, we've lost friends and family, trying to speak out against these kinds of things.
and regardless to what the media has said, uh, Marquise did not have a weapon. Marquise didn't have anything to actually do with what was going on. He was a passenger in a vehicle that was in an accident that he decided, this is not about me, I want to go home. And he was too blocked from home. The officer pulled the weapon without asking any questions, and this is in black and white on paper, everything. A cop did not say, stop. You stay here, don't move, don't do anything. Marquise proceeded to walk home and started jogging down the driveway and was shot at nine times. And one bullet hit him, said, severed his leg order, and he died before he hit the ground. So when y'all say, or other races say black lives, want to get mad at us because we say black lives matter, majority, if you look at the news, you pay attention, you read, Majority of the black men that are dying have no weapons in their hands. They don't cause any type of friction. They're dying on our streets because the police, as he said, are afraid of us. They feel that we, with the dark skin, and this is women too. We have Sandra Bland who's dead. We have several women that some of y'all may not know about that are dead because they are afraid of us. The media has portrayed us that way. Rappers have portrayed us that way. So even now, with what's going on, I've started paying attention and I've talked to one of my friends. White people are afraid of us. Y'all get in the elevator with us, y'all are afraid of us. And the majority of us, we, we're not going to do anything. We're not even thinking about you. <laughs> <laughs> we are just getting to where we need to go. I have several Hispanic friends that use the N-word like it's nothing. Like it's nothing. And I'm like, do you realize you're basically on the same level that we're on? When they look at y'all, they look at they see the same thing with, with you guys. So as a community, we need to come together. San Antonio needs to wake up and understand there is a problem here in our own city. We worry about what goes on in Baton Rouge, Minnesota, and my heart aches for those people. But look and pay attention to what's going on in your own city. Read, go to our, we have, we have protests, we have all kinds of different things going on in the city. And we put it out on social media. Um, I don't do Instagram and all that, Twitter for all that. <laughs> but we need to, we, y'all, that's what we need y'all to come out and support us. If they see us all as one community, as one person, and we come out and we speak against the violence that the police are doing here in our own city, we can stop what's going. If we start here, it's like a pebble. You drop a pebble, and what does it do? So we got to start here and worry about what's going on in our city. We can't go into other cities and work, because they're going to worry about theirs. It's San Antonio, and ever since my nephew was killed, it is only a handful of people that come out when we protest or we go to anything. And, I, and it was said from downtown, we're not worried about them. They like this. What can they do to us? But if we come together as a majority and as a voice, as one, they can't do anything but listen to us. So, sorry. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Walter Perry. I'm a community activist over on the east side of town. Show of hands, real quick. Who been to the east side lately? Not Dick New the Hill. <laughs> in the east side. Well, let me tell you this really quickly. I'm a product of the east side community. I grew up, I ran with gangs as a teenager. I ended up going to prison at the age of 17. I did almost eight years. Uh, I went from 1993 to 2001. While I was in there, uh, I obtained my associate's uh, degree. I got a truck driver's license, and I still hold that right now before I get my business degree. Uh, that's, I've been home 15 years already. Yeah. yeah. Right. The reason why 
why I stated that is because there are a lot of guys like me on my side of town. But you wouldn't know that because these guys get the doors shut in their faces constantly, every day. I just have to slip through the cracks. I don't know how, but I did. Now, what I'm doing, I'm on the east side. I'm talking to a lot of these young brothers and young sisters, Latino sisters, white, because there are certain sides of the east side that we have this mentality. When you think about the east side, what do you think about? Good, right? You think about it's going down over there. You can pretty much do whatever you want to do. But that's not the case right now. The case on the east side right now is that we've had over 12 murders since the beginning of this year. A lot of these murders have been senseless murders. Murders behind anything from a Facebook post to somebody looking at you at, in, in the store. So my fight is not necessarily just the police. That's one aspect of it. Our fight is mentally on that side of town. As a people, we have a mental disease that we think that Hood mentality is the way for us to go, and it's not the case. So what I'm preaching right now to my people, all the people on my side of town, because I deal with a lot of youth, I just left a, a youth forum just now, is that you have to educate yourself on who you are. A lot of us don't even know who we are. We have names, we have nicknames, we have street names that we got tattooed on us, we have all this other stuff, but we don't really know who we are as a people. So I'm serving as an example to people who went through these types of things to show them that there are opportunities. But here's the problem. I just told you that there's a lot of guys like me over there. But they get doors shut in their faces because of the things that they've been through. So I'm asking everybody who's white, everybody who's black, everybody who's Hispanic, Latino, Latino, Native American, whatever you are in here, our power is in the vote. That is the true power. We can make all the programs we want to. We can save a few hundred, save a few dozen. But when you pass law, you are changing thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Who is not registered to vote in here? Tell the truth. Those that are. Y'all need, need to get them some voter registration. But if you are registered to vote and you're not voting, you are part of the problem. You are a part, a part of the problem. When you don't vote, when you don't go down to city council, when you don't know who your representatives are in your district, you are a problem. Not only that, when you see people who are rallying for certain causes, like police brutality, funding, for social programs, when our youth on that side of town, a lot of them have not had a job, and they're reaching the ages of 19 years old. I remember growing up, I started working at the age of 14 with BCYC. Those programs do not exist over there on that side of town. You know why? Because the African American culture is not being respected. It's not being looked upon as people that need the help. They call us those baggy niggas on the east side. Yeah. When you're a business owner and you go for funding to the city, they say, what do, what, what do you want? Say, I want, I want help. Oh, no, you're going to use that money and flip it for drugs. That is the mentality that the city council and our black mayor has formed. And she lives on the east side. On the east side. Our council person lives on the east side. She walks right outside of her yard, and she looks at downtown, and she walks right back in. Not with the intentions of trying to come up with something new for that side of town, but to see how she can suck the rest of the life out of those people. The east side is not a people of savages. There are people that need help. We have hope. We have a lot of creative people on that side of town. We have a lot of fatherless babies on that side of town. We have a lot of people walking around discombobulated, full of drugs, and they need help. So my white friends, you're probably looking at me and saying, wow, man, you know, I really admire this guy for standing up here. No, I don't want you to do that. I need your vote. 
I need you to look at our issues and say, how can how can I use my white privilege to help this group? Latinas, Latinos, American Indians, or, or, or whoever else is in here, you need to figure out how we can put our votes together. First of all, let's think of something that we can all benefit from collectively as a group. And let's vote it. Let's vote about it. And find out who your representatives are. If they're not doing what they're supposed to do, you vote them out. Yeah. Vote them out. Because if you don't vote these people out, they're going to continue to do what they're supposed to be. They're going to continue to suck the life out of your community. We have problems like affordable housing. The east side, what they did, gentrification, here's the definition. Yes. You lower the price of something inside of a community, and you make everything cheap, then you come in and you buy that lower price. And once you get it, you raise it up again. That's what's happening on the east side right now. People were displaced from a large community and just shot everywhere. What they did was bought up the whole area, tore down the places, build something else, and raise the value up, and now these people can't even move back. Economic genocide. Why is that? And they were promised this. Over 300 families was promised this. So this is something to think about because it's gonna affect your neighborhood soon too. Gentrification is real. And the problem starts when we don't educate each other. We have to educate our people. We have to de-educate them and then re-educate them again. So I'm asking everybody right now, if you have access, access to resources, please, I don't, it doesn't necessarily have to be money, it can be income services. It could just be your vote. But we need you, when we go to City Hall, to ask for these types of things. And black people, I'm talking to my people. Vote. Your vote matters. Don't sit up and say, I don't like this person. I'm not going to go vote because the person I want is not there. No, the person that's making decisions for your neighborhood and for your kids' future is sitting right at City Hall. And if you don't get up and go do something, I don't want to hear that crime. I'm looking at everybody in here. Because the problem is us. It starts with us. What are you going to do to make your community better? I'm not going to depend on nobody to save me. I got God for that. But what I'm depending on somebody is somebody to step up, speak up, and go to the polls. So join your neighborhood association. Join your PTAs and get involved with your kids' future. Join some things that's going to change your neighborhood one city at a time, one block at a time. So you don't have to be seeing somebody like me standing up here yelling at you or having one of your kids <laughs> go to the penitentiary because they didn't know the law. So before I close, I want to tell you that crime on that side of town is tearing us apart. And it comes from lack of love. So I want everybody to think about this when they go home. What can I do to be an inspiration to somebody else tomorrow? And when you wake up, I guarantee you're going to have the answer if you sincerely believe it in your heart. My name is Walter Perry. I'm easy to find. I'm on the east side all the time. And if you can't find me, I'm on Facebook. Go vote. Thank you. I'm going to tell you something about me. I am not a failure. I stand up. I'm not perfect, but I stand up in the face of adversity, in the face of racism, anything. We have to stand. Because if we don't do that, we're going to get walked all over. And what I wanted to do tonight was just really empower everyone to find your inner voice. Know that everybody in here, that's the most powerful tool you have. Don't stop. You can't stop. And say to yourself every day that you won't stop. There's no way we make it if we lose our voice. And if you haven't found it yet, that's OK. Because a lot of times what we do is we do it in other ways. Right? Your voice could be the work you do with your hands. Your voice could be the emails that you send, that you pass along. Your voice could be a handshake, a hug. Let's do that. Let's make sure that we're spreading love. Let's make sure that we're unifying. Let's make sure that we're teaching people that we believe the same. We have to do that. I want to talk to you from a, um, a mother. Again, forget your psychology, all right? I don't want you all to know me as that. I want you to know Mary Kay. And it's so important because I have a two-year-old son, and it breaks my heart. He's two now. My thought is what happens when he's 12, 22, 32. I can't go home. 
I don't have family here. But I can't go to Chicago. You want to know why I can't go where my mom is, my brother is, where my uncles are, where my father's resting place is? I can't go there because they will kill him. Right. And I didn't labor that long. I'm not out here being a single mom busting my butt to bury Charleston. I am here to make sure he becomes somebody. At two years old, I'm already hearing how articulate he gets, how such a great job you're doing with him. Well, you know what? I would really love for everybody in the world to see that. I would love for by the time he's 22, that it's not just a subset of people who was able to talk about who he was before he became an adult. Yeah. I need you to know him when he's a grown man, and I can't do it without your help. None of the mothers, none of the fathers, nobody in here can do it without your help. I embrace you. I can hug and kiss each and every last one of you. But let me tell you something. Love is what we need. We're not going to get through it without it. And I love you. I don't know you, but I love you. I love you. Baby, I love you. You hear me? I love you too. And I'm asking that you love us back. And how you love us is be our ally. Don't be afraid. We spoke before about we got you. We got you. Those aren't just words. You have to understand something about black culture. When we say that, we mean that. Right. 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 We take care of our own. And as allies, you are our own. So I love you. I hope that you don't fall silent. I hope that you become empowered, that you stay the course. And I did write an essay Sunday because I was that distraught. And when I'm upset, that's all I can think to do is write. You know, I don't believe in violence. I don't believe in uh, profanity. I don't believe in looting. I believe in taking a stance and showing you that I'm everything that you say I'm not. So I have that essay here today. And I know that people don't like things that are long. It is six pages. But if you want it, let me know. I guarantee you will not be disappointed. It is titled, How We Overcome, because there's a lot in here that all of you have already said. So I know that we're on the right path. If you want it, let me know. Thank you. Like this. 
All that being said also, somebody mentioned it earlier, City Hall, the Citizens Advisory Board, are people that are not even a part of the citizens that they're representing. That's another thing that I think needs to be, that needs to go down, I'm sorry, I thought somebody was talking about that. Uh, that's another thing that, that I think needs to be changed. Uh, we got people out there that, that's representing us, the community, that is not a part of the community. Um, and so, all that being said, police reform needs to get in those settings. Like Walter was saying, we need to vote people out. Um, there's a lot of shading that's going on right now in our city. I think one of it is because we are very, like, we're, we're a very huge growing city. By 2020, we're expected to be one of the great cities in America. And I think there's a lot of things that, because of that, San Antonio is trying to keep under wraps. Because they don't, want, they don't want us to know what's going on. They don't want that in the media because we want to be great, we want to be cool, we want to be like the other cities. But we, like, like people said, we might end up like those other cities, like Baton Rouge, like Berkeley, like Baltimore. Because I can guarantee you when one thing goes wrong, this city is not as much different as like that we have to think they are. Just because we've got the, the Spurs and they're together, I can guarantee you that these cops around here, they're not, they're not as good as we try, to, we try to think they are. So all that being said, moving forward, I think community is very important. Like, like, like my brother Walter was saying, we gotta go on the other end, we gotta just we can't just stop it just we gotta we gotta go to love. We gotta be ready to educate people. We gotta be ready to show, show each other love. Because we got a lot of people out there that are lost and confused. I, I mentored over at Sam Houston High School. There's a little brother, a little boy named Eli. He's a freshman. Um, he's a track runner. I ran track before he was at UTSA, so we connected there. Um, Eli was telling me about a, a running that he had with a police officer and how angry he was and what he wanted to do to the next cop <coughs> that he ran into. All I saw was Trayvon Martin, Mike Brown, I just saw the list. And I just got scared for that little, that little boy's heart. And we need that mentoring. We need people to go in there and show them a different way. Because there's a lot of frustrating things going on right now. We got our young people that don't even know how to navigate those emotions. And we're not really showing up until they die. Yeah. Yeah. So that's an issue. So I'm not gonna talk much further from here. Um, I do have cards, because I definitely wanna stay in connection with everybody. Um, I'm working with a lot of people, like Walter, like Miss Deborah, like Miss Mary Kay, like Miss Mary, which I appreciate so much for this uh, for this gathering, for this meeting, um, and, and my brother Mike Lowe. Who, anytime we out there marching, anytime I'm hosting the gathering, he's hosting the gathering. I can guarantee you, you know, see my brother Mike Lowe right next to me. No matter how much we differ on opinions, we were just talking about this last time at the gathering. Uh, it's like the Malcolm X in my MLK. <laughs> <laughs> Love him like a brother, man. Love him like a brother. Um, but we're going to be out there, so come out, um, and I want to say thank you to everybody. I got a whole bunch of cars with me today, um, and so uh, we're going to be doing some things moving forward. Stay in touch. So. Do that. 
If you go around to your garden party, do that. I will say this, at this point in the game, with this many people dying, we no longer need allies. If you are here to be an ally, I ask you to reconsider. Forget allies. At this point, we need accomplices. If you're not here, you're not going to be an ally. with Ashley Billard. She's the president of Black Lives Matter at UTSA. And we just wanted to get a general statement from her about how she felt about this event, how it went, and the overall Black Lives Matter movement across the United States and the current status of race relations in the United States. Hey, um, I think the black I think the event tonight is a great step towards having a conversation that's inclusive of you know, um, the victims of police brutality, the victims of anti-black violence within our San Antonio community and worldwide, but also with the allies who want to contribute to the cause and they may not know where to start. So this is like a learning opportunity for them. They can come, they can discuss amongst themselves, you know, the issues and hold each other accountable, but at the same time, refer back to having that African leadership that I believe is important in order to dismantle anti-blackness. Because if you don't understand how white supremacy affects a black person or African people and you know as a whole collective then how can you work together towards dismantling it um, you know the room is very hot but I think our passion for justice and for liberation and a change is even hotter and um, I think tonight a lot of us will take away from these conversations and learn how to implement them in our own lives and we'll connect better and unify which is also um, which is also a powerful standpoint. Like, you can't do it alone. Like um, Reverend Max was saying earlier, you have to get together with people and work together in order to truly make a change. Um, one of the points that I wish we kind of um, elaborated on tonight was how, like, yes, love and unity is going to be beneficial to us, but we also need to have the money and the power to back ourselves up. You know, when we dismantle this system, what are we going to implement in its place, you know, what are we going to replace it with? Um, yes, solving police brutality is one thing, but police brutality doesn't is not a source of its own. It comes from something else, and it's a um, it's a symptom of a much deeper problem, aka colonialism. And so, how do we get rid of colonialism? And so, I think those are the steps that we need to take in order to truly receive the liberation that we ask for. And hopefully, um, from this, I can take away a lot of different points, different viewpoints. And I can figure it out to see how we can even reflect, you know, on the UTSA campus and how we can make a change for the students there and get them involved in the San Antonio community and realize it's not just a social media movement, it's a real life movement and we have to be proactive in that. Sorry, um, did I answer all the questions? Yes, you did. Once okay. again, we want to thank <laughs> Ashley for giving us some of her time today. Actually, what I think it's important for um, people to understand is white supremacy doesn't just affect African Americans or Hispanic community. And a lot of people, um, I think we talk about white privilege so much that people don't realize how, I don't like saying white people because I don't believe in that, but um, <laughs> you're greatly oppressed by white supremacy as well. Uh -huh. yeah. And one thing oh. is, I feel like that community is so much more asleep than other communities are Definitely. because you think that you're Definitely. safe because mm -hmm. of your color. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think part of Black Lives Matter is all lives matter is because all life comes from black. <laughs> So if we're not safe, you guys definitely are safe. Yeah, so it's are. important to understand how white supremacy is oppressing you as well. Educating people on things like microaggressions. A lot of people don't know what that means. A lot of people do it unconsciously. What, what was the word? 
Oh, she literally said something in there about her son being so articulate. Yeah. Yeah. That is a microaggression. Yeah. As if it is somehow amazing that a young right. black child can be so articulate. Oh, okay. yeah. That yeah. is a microaggression. Oh, when Daniel Brooks, the actress, was the, uh, flying first yeah. class on an airplane, yeah. and they said, oh, aren't you lucky? <laughs> right. Yeah. As if, right, as if that's somehow, you know, oh, you made it to this, this you know, section, where like that's unheard of. You know? right. Those are microaggressions. Those are small, little racist attacks that are done unconsciously, and they don't seem over. Right, like you said, you're not, you know, you don't have a cross burning in your yard anymore. Yeah. And that, I think that it goes to, it's more convert. I, I think that we get taught this, like, historical lesson of, like, a hundred years ago, it was this way, and that is racism. No, we need to recognize what is racism and racial prejudice now, and the language they're using now, and confront that. And you know, I just wanted to add, you mentioned running for, for local public offices like school boards, but I would add that uh, both our county and our city have various boards and commissions. These are not, for the most part, elected offices. You can actually apply to serve on them, and, it, and it's up to a city councilman in that district to uh, help choose. And a lot of these boards do not have, have plenty of open seats. The position I used to serve on was an elected position. It was called a representative of the poor, uh, which oversaw uh, programs under the Community Action Division, which is a federal program. I served for about 14 years, but over half of that was as a holdover because I couldn't find anyone to run for my seat. Um, and that's a problem that all these boards and commissions have, which are volunteer positions. The housing commission still has holdovers, and th this is the this is a this is a commission with the city that addresses housing issues. I, I we I, you I would encourage any of you to get involved with support, run for various school board seats, um, or serve on various community boards. But also remember the city. Uh, can, you, needs people to serve on the various boards and commissions that actually uh, a lot of the initial action that city councils take come from these boards and commissions. Police, uh, I mean, it's very real life, I mean, real factual, relevant information up to the very hour and moment. And the last thing is mapping police violence. Those websites, campaignzero.org, uh, checkthepolice.org, uh, the township, either .org or .com, and then mapping police violence. Listen, if you don't know what you're talking about, it's kind of hard to hold the conversation. It's kind of hard to, to build credibility if you're just going off of your opinions and your feelings. But men lie, women lie, numbers don't. And the numbers speak for themselves. Those are some resources to be able to quote those numbers. I've been around. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> So you, you remember the, the 1960s and the 70s? <laughs> Vietnam. Free love. Yeah, free love. But, you know, a lot of dead soldiers over in Vietnam, a lot of dead people here. So it wasn't, not everything, you know, freedom is the last, what is this, Janice Johnson song? Anyway, uh, here's an idea. Everybody partner up. You know what the police do? When they're out at, around, they always have a partner. I always have a guy that's backing him up wherever he is on the other side of the block on the side of town. What we need to do tonight, everybody you see here, how are you going to guarantee, you know, the future? This is the future, folks. The people you see here, this is it. Get a partner. We all partner up. Then, when something happens, you know, we've got a partner. We know what happened here tonight. We know what we want to see in the future. Just an idea.